Hello, Roger here. I'm going to do a reading of Shelley's poem, an epic poem um, called The Revolt of Islam. And first I'm going to read the preface, but just before that we'll have a quick warm-up with two um, sonnets uh, which Shelley wrote um, at around the time that he was responding to uh, the disillusionment that people had with the French Revolution. And um, uh, this is a follow-up to my reading of Paul Foote's article on Shelley and also uh, some stuff about the trial of Socrates. And why I think this is important is that... Um, at the moment, there is an increase in absolute authoritarianism and a closing down of other viewpoints. And the response to that, um, we can look to our ancestors to see how their response um, uh, is actually quite inspiring. Now, Paul Foote in his talk says about Queen Mab, which is another wonderful um, epic poem by Shelley, uh, that that was in fact the Bible of the Chartists. And I don't think the Chartists is a widely known movement in the modern age in, in, in the UK, United Kingdom. Uh, and the... Um, reforms of society uh, which came out of that movement um, and other reforms that followed, say, the work of Henry George in the late 19th, early 20th century, etc., is all but forgotten. Um, and I do think that this classical literature and these allusions in romantic um, poetry and the romantic movement and its allusions to ancient Greek and Roman literature is very important. Um, and so whilst the references will be obscure to us in our popular culture, what popular culture is today, um, popular culture back then, whether it's Shakespeare in the 16th century or whether it's... Um, uh, Pindar in, 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 in well, I think, circa 500 BC, say, or um, you know, Roman literature around 2,000 years ago, you know, the, the, the first century of the Common Era and the last uh, century of the um, uh, antiquity. But anyway, I'm going to start off, rather, rather than sort of, go into this we're just gonna i'm gonna read shelley's preface in a minute and then just go for it on the whole of uh revolt of islam but just just to warm up this is a sonnet which shelley uh wrote entitled england in 1819 an old mad blind despised and dying king Princes, the dregs of their dull race who flow through public scorn, mud from a muddy spring. Rulers who neither see, nor feel, nor know, but leech-like to their fainting countries cling, till they drop blind in blood without a blow. A people starved and stabbed in the untilled field, an army whom liberticide and prey makes as a two-edged sword to all who wield. Golden and sanguine laws which tempt and slay. Religion Christless, godless, a book sealed, a senate, time's worst statute unrepealed, our graves from which a glorious phantom may burst to illumine our tempestuous day. And Ozymandias uh, by Percy Bush Shelley. 
I met a traveller from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert, near them on the sand, half sunk. A shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculpture well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck. Boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Right, now if I can just get back to my place here. Here we are. So... This is a PDF which can be found online. Uh, this is the version held on the Anarchist Library. Um, there's the contents page. And we'll start with Shelley in his own words, the author's preface. The poem which I now present to the world is an attempt from which I scarcely dare to expect success and in which a writer of established fame might fail without disgrace. It is an experiment on the temper of the public mind as to how far a thirst for a happier condition of moral and political society survives among the enlightened and refined, the tempests which have shaken the age in which we live. I have sought to enlist the harmony of metrical language, the ethereal combinations of the fancy, the rapid and subtle transitions of human passion, all those elements which essentially compose a poem in the cause of a liberal and comprehensive morality, and in the view of kindling within the bosoms of my readers a virtuous enthusiasm for those doctrines of liberty and justice, that faith and hope in something good which neither violence nor misrepresentation nor prejudice can ever totally extinguish from mankind. For this purpose I've chosen a story of human passion in its most universal character, diversified with moving and romantic adventures and appealing in contempt of all artificial opinions or institutions to the common sympathies of every human breast. I have made no attempt to recommend the motives which I would substitute for those at present governing mankind. By methodical and systematic argument, I would only awaken the feelings so that the reader should see the beauty of true virtue and be incited to those inquiries which have led to my moral and political creed and that of some of the sublimest intellects in the world. The poem, therefore, with the exception of the first canto, which is purely introductory, is narrative, not didactic. It is a succession of pictures illustrating the growth and progress of individual mind aspiring after excellence, and devoted to the love of mankind, its influence in refining and making pure the most daring and uncommon impulses of the imagination, the understanding and the senses its impatience at all the oppressions which are done under the sun, its tendency to awaken public hope and to enlighten and improve mankind, the rapid effects of the application of that tendency, the awakening of an immense nation from their slavery and degradation to a true sense of moral dignity and freedom, the bloodless dethronement of their oppressors and the unveiling of the religious frauds by which they had been deluded into submission, the tranquillity of successful patriotism and the universal toleration and benevolence of true philanthropy, the treachery and barbarity of hired soldiers, vice not the object of punishment and hatred, but kindness and pity, the faithfulness, the faithlessness of tyrants, the confederacy of the rulers of the world and the restoration of the expelled dynasty by foreign arms the massacre and extermination of the patriots, and the victory of established power, the consequence of legitimate despotism, civil war, famine, plague, superstition, 
and an utter extinction of the domestic affections, the judicial murder of the advocates of liberty, the temporary triumph of oppression that secure earnest of its final and inevitable fall, the transient nature of ignorance and error and the eternity of genius and virtue. Such is the series of delineations of which the poem consists. And if the lofty passions with which it has been my scope to distinguish this story shall not excite in the reader a generous impulse, an ardent thirst for excellence, an interest profound and strong, such as belongs to no meaner desires, let not the failure be imputed to a natural unfitness for human sympathy. In these sublime and animating themes, it is the business of the poet to communicate to others the pleasure and the enthusiasm arising out of those images and feelings in the vivid presence of which within his own mind consist at once his inspiration and his reward. The panic, which like an epidemic transport seized upon all classes of men during the excesses consequent upon the French Revolution, is gradually giving place to sanity. It has ceased to be believed that whole generations of mankind ought to consign themselves to a hopeless inheritance of ignorance and misery, because a nation of men who had been dupes and slaves for centuries were incapable of conducting themselves with the wisdom and tranquility of free men so soon as some of their fetters were partially loosened. That their conduct could not have been marked by any other characters than ferocity and thoughtlessness is the historical fact from which liberty derives all its recommendations and falsehood, the worst features of its deformity. There is a re reflux in the tide of human things which bears the shipwrecked hopes of men into a secure haven after the storms are past, methinks those who now live have survived an age of despair. The French Revolution may be considered as one of those manifestations of a general state of feeling among civilised mankind produced by a defeat of correspondence between the knowledge existing in society and the improvement or gradual abolition of political institutions. The year 1788 may be assumed as the epoch of one of the most important crises produced by this feeling. The sympathies connected with that event extended to every bosom. The most generous and amiable natures were those which participated the most extensively in these sympathies. But such a degree of unmingled good was expected as it was impossible to realise. If the revolution had been in every respect prosperous, then misrule and superstition would lose half their claims to our abhorrence, as fetters which the captive can unlock with the slightest motion of his fingers, and which do not eat with poisonous rust into the soul. The revulsion occasioned by the atrocities of the demagogues and the re-establishment of successive tyrannies in France was terrible and felt in the remotest corner of the civilised world. Could they listen to the plea of reason, who had groaned under the calamities of a social state, according to the provisions of which one man riots in luxury, whilst another famishes for want of bread? Can he, who the day before was a trampled slave, suddenly become liberal-minded, forbearing and independent? This is the consequence of the habits of a state of society to be produced by resolute perseverance and indefatigable hope and long-suffering and long-believing courage and the systematic efforts of generations of men of intellect and virtue. Such is the lesson which experience teaches now. But on the first reverses of hope in the progress of French liberty, the sanguine eagerness for good overleaped the solution of these questions, and for a time extinguished itself in the unexpectedness of their result. Thus, many of the most ardent and tender-hearted of the worshippers of public good have been morally ruined by what a partial glimpse of the events they deplored appeared to show as the melancholy desolation of all their cherished hopes. Hence, gloom and misanthropy have become the characteristics of the age in which we live. The solace of a disappointment that unconsciously finds relief only in the willful exaggeration of its own despair. 
This influence has tainted the literature of the age with the hopelessness of the minds from which it flows. Metaphysics, I ought to expect Sir W. Drummond's academical questions, a volume of very acute and powerful metaphysical criticism and inquiries into moral and philosophy political science have become little else than vain attempts to revive exploded superstitions or sophisms like those of Mr Malthus. It is remarkable as a symptom of the revival of public hope that Mr Malthus has assigned in the later editions of his work an indefinite domin dominion to moral restraint over the principle of population. This concession answers all the inferences from his doctrine unfavourable to human improvement and reduces the essay on population to a commentary illustrative of the unanswerableness of political justice, calculated to lull the oppressors of mankind into a security of everlasting triumph. Our works of fiction and poetry have been overshadowed by the same infectious gloom, but mankind appear to me to be emerging from their trance. I am aware, methinks, of a slow, gradual, silent change in that belief I have composed the following poem. I do not presume to enter into competition with our greatest contemporary poets, yet I am unwilling to tread in the footsteps of any who have preceded me. I have sought to avoid the imitation of any style of language or versification peculiar to the original minds of which it is the character, designing that, even if what I have produced be worthless, it should still be properly my own. Nor have I permitted any system related to mere words to divert the attention of the reader from whatever interest I may have succeeded in creating, to my own ingenuity in contriving to discuss them according to the rules of criticism. I've simply clothed my thoughts in what appeared to me the most obvious and appropriate language. A person familiar with nature, and with the most celebrated productions of the human mind, can scarcely err in following the instinct with respect to selection of language produced by that familiarity. There is an education peculiarly fitted for a poet, without which genius and sensibility can hardly fill the circle of their capacities. No education, indeed, can entitle to this appellation a dull, unobservant mind, or one though neither dull nor unobservant, in which the channels of communication between thought and expression have been obstructed or closed. How far it is my fortune to belong to either of the latter classes, I cannot know. I aspire to be something better. The circumstances of my accidental education have been favourable to this ambition. I have been familiar from boyhood with mountains and lakes and the sea and the solitude of forests. Danger which sports upon the brink of precipices has been my playmate. I have trodden the glaciers of the Alps and lived under the eye of Mont Blanc. I have been a wanderer among distant fields. I have sailed down mighty rivers and seen the sun rise and set and the stars come forth, whilst I have sailed night and day down a rapid stream among mountains. I have seen populous cities and have watched the passions which rise and spread and sink and change amongst assembled multitudes of men. I have seen the theatre of the more visible ravages of tyranny and war, cities and villages reduced to scattered groups of black and roofless houses, and the naked inhabitants sitting famished upon their desolated thresholds. I have conversed with living men of genius, the poetry of ancient Greece and Rome and modern Italy, and our own country has been to me, like external nature, a passion and an enjoyment. Such are the sources from which the materials for the imagery of my poem have been drawn. I have considered poetry in its most comprehensive sense, and have read the poets and the historians and the metaphysicians. In this sense, there may be such a thing as perfectibility in works of fiction, notwithstanding the concession often made by the advocates of human improvement, that perfectibility is a term applicable only to science whose writings have been accessible to me and have looked upon the beautiful and majestic scenery of the earth as common sources of those elements which it is the province of the poet to embody and combine. Yet the experience and the feelings to which I refer do not in themselves constitute men poets, 
but only prepares them to be the auditors of those who are. How far I shall be found to possess that more essential attribute of poetry, the power of awakening in others' sensations like those which animate my own bosom, is that which to speak sincerely I know not, and which, with an acquiescent and contented spirit, I expect to be taught by the effect which I shall produce upon those who I, am, I now address. I have avoided, as I have said before, the imitation of any contemporary style. But there must be a resemblance which does not depend upon their own will between all the writers of any particular age. They cannot escape from subjugation to a common influence which arises out of an infinite combination of circumstances belonging to the times in which they live, though each is in a degree the author of the very influence by which his being is thus pervaded. Thus the tragic poets of the age of Pericles, the Italian revivers of ancient learning, those mighty intellects of our own country that succeeded the Reformation, the translators of the Bible, Shakespeare, Spencer, the dramatists of the reign of Elizabeth, and Lord Bacon, Milton stands alone in the age which he illumined. The coldest spirits of the interval that succeeded all resemble each other and differ from every other in their several classes. In this view of things, Ford can no more be called the imitator of Shakespeare than Shakespeare the imitator of Ford. There were perhaps few other points of resemblance between these two men than that which the universal and inevitable influence of their age produced. And this is an influence which neither the meanest scribbler nor the sublimest genius of any era can escape and which I have not attempted to escape. I have adopted the stanza of Spencer, a measure inexpressibly beautiful, not because I consider it a finer model of poetical harmony than the blank verse of Shakespeare and Milton, but because in the latter there is no shelter for mediocrity. You must either succeed or fail. This perhaps an aspiring spirit should desire. But I was enticed also by the brilliancy and magnificence of sound which a mind that has been nourished upon musical thoughts can produce by a just and harmonious arrangement of the pauses of this measure. Yet there will be found some instances where I have completely failed in this attempt, and one which I here request the reader to consider as an erratum, which there is left, most inadvertently, an Alexandrine in the middle of a stanza. But in this, as in every other respect, I have written fearlessly. It is the misfortune of this age that its writers, too thoughtless of immorality, are exquisitely sensible to temporary praise or blame. They write with the fear of reviews before their eyes. This system of criticism sprang up in that torpid interval when poetry was not. Poetry and the art which professes to regulate and limit its powers cannot subsist together. Longinus could not have been the contemporary of Homer, nor Bolio of Horace, yet this species of criticism never presumed to assert an understanding of its own. It was always, unlike true science, followed, not preceded, the opinion of mankind, and would even now bribe with worthless adulation some of our greatest poets to impose gratuitous fetters on their own imaginations and become unconscious accomplices in the daily murder of all genius, either not so aspiring or not so fortunate as their own. I have sought, therefore, to write as I believe that Homer, Shakespeare and Milton wrote, with an utter disregard of anonymous censure, I'm certain that calumny and misrepresentation, though it may move me to compassion, cannot disturb my peace. I shall understand the expressive silence of those sagacious enemies who dare not trust themselves to speak. I shall endeavour to extract from the midst of insult and contempt and maledictions those ad admonitions which may tend to correct whatever imperfections such censures may discover in this my first serious appeal to the public. If certain critics were as clear-sighted as they are malignant, how great would be the benefit to be derived from their virulent writings. 
As it is, I fear I shall be malicious enough to be amused with their paltry tricks and lame invectives. Should the public judge that my composition is worthless, I shall indeed bow before the tribunal from which Milton received his crown of immortality and shall seek to gather, if I live, strength from that defeat, which may nerve me to some new enterprise of thought, which may not be worthless. I cannot conceive that Lucretius, when he mediated, meditated that poem whose doctrines are yet the basis of our metaphysical knowledge and whose eloquence has been the wonder of mankind wrote in awe of such censure as the hired sophists of the impure and superstitious nobleman of Rome might affix to what he should produce. It was at that period when Greece was led captive and Asia made tributary to the Republic, fast verging itself to slavery and ruin, that a multitude of Syrian captives, bigoted to the worship of their obscene Ashtoroth and the unworthy successors of Socrates and Zeno, found there a precarious subsistence by administrating under the name of freedmen to the vices and vanities of the great. These wretched men were skilled to plead with a superficial but plausible set of sophisms in favour of that contempt for virtue, which is the portion of slaves, and that faith in portents, the most fatal substitute for benevolence in the imaginations of men, which arising from the enslaved communities of the East, then first began to overwhelm the Western nations in its stream. Were these the kind of men whose disapprobation the wise and lofty-minded Lucretius should have regarded with a salutary awe. The latest and perhaps the meanest of those who follow in his footsteps would disdain to hold life on such conditions. The poem now presented to the public occupied little more than six months in the composition. That period has been devoted to the task with unremitting ardour and enthusiasm. I have exercised a watchful and earnest criticism on my work as it grew under my hands. I would willingly have sent it forth to the world with that perfection which long labour and revision is said to bestow. But I found that if I should gain something in exactness by this method, I might lose much of the newness and energy of imagery and language as it flowed fresh from my mind. And although the mere composition occupied no more than six months, the thoughts thus arranged were slowly gathered in as many years. I trust that the reader will carefully distinguish between those opinions which have a dramatic propriety in reference to the characters which they are designed to elucidate, and such as are properly my own. The erroneous and degrading idea which men have conceived of a supreme being, for instance, is spoken against, but not the supreme being itself. The belief which some superstitious persons whom I have brought upon the stage entertain of the deity as injurious to the character of his benevolence is widely different from my own in recommending also a great and important change in the spirit which animates the social institutions of mankind. I have avoided all flattery to those violent and malignant passions of our nature which are ever on the watch to mingle with and to alloy the most beneficial innovations. There is no quarter given to revenge or envy or prejudice. Love is celebrated everywhere as the sole law which should govern the moral world. Uh, I will skip the dedication. Um, it's dedicated to um, Mary Goodwin Shelley, uh, authoress of uh, Frankenstein. I'll just say this. There is no danger to man that knows what life and death is. There's not any law exceeds his knowledge, neither is it lawful that he should stoop to any other law. <coughs> just going to have a little break. And then we shall dive in. The Revolt of Islam, Canto 1 by Shelley. 
When the last hope of trampled France had failed like a brief dream of unremaining glory, from visions of despair I rose and scaled the peak of an aerial promontory, whose caverned base with the vexed surge was hoary, and saw the golden dawn break forth, and waken each cloud and every wave, but transistory the calm, for sudden the firm earth was shaken, as if by the last wreck its frame were overtaken. So as I stood, one blast of muttering thunder burst in far peals along the waveless deep, when gathering fast around, above and under, long trains of tremulous mist began to creep, until their complicated lines did steep. The Orient sun in shadow, not a sound was heard. One horrible repose did keep the forests and the floods and all around. Darkness, more dread than night, was poured upon the ground. Hark, tis the rushing of a wind that sweeps earth and the ocean. See, the lightnings yawn, deluging heaven with fire, and the lashed deeps glitter and boil beneath. It rages on one mighty stream, whirlwind and waves upthrown, lightning and hail and darkness eddying by. There is a pause, the seabirds that were gone into the, their caves to shriek, come forth to spy what calm has fallen on earth, what light is in the sky. For where the irresistible storm has cloven that fearful darkness the blue sky was seen fretted with many a fair cloud interwoven most delicately and the ocean green beneath that opening spot of blue serene quivered like burning emerald calm was spread on all below but far on high between earth and the upper air the vast clouds fled countless and swift as leaves on autumn's tempest shed Forever, as the war became more fierce between the whirlwinds and the rack on high, that spot grew more serene. Blue light did pierce the woof of those white clouds which seemed to lie far, deep and motionless, while through the sky the pallid semicircle of the moon passed on in slow and moving majesty, its upper horn arrayed in mists which soon but slowly fledged like dew beneath the means of noon. I could not choose but gaze, a fascination dwelt in that moon and sky and clouds which drew my fancy thither, and in expectation of what I knew not, I remained. The hue of white moon amid that heaven so blue, suddenly stained with shadow did appear, a speck, a cloud, a shape approaching grew like a great ship in the sun sinking sphere beheld afar at sea and swift it came anear even lit like a bark which from a chasm of mountainous dark fast and overhanging on a river which there collects the strength of all its fountains comes forth whilst with the speed its frame doth quiver sails oars and stream tending to one endeavour so from that chasm of light a winged form on all the winds of heaven approaching ever floated dilating as it came the storm pursued it with fierce blasts and lightning swift and warm a course precipitous of dizzy speed suspending thought and breath a monstrous sight for in the air do i behold indeed an eagle and a serpent wreathed in fight and now relaxing its impetuous flight before the aerial rock on which i stood the eagle hovering wheeled to left and right and hung with lingering wings over the flood and startled with its yells the wide air solitude a shaft of light upon its wings descended and every golden feather gleamed therein feather and scale inextricably blended the serpent's mailed and many-coloured skin shone through the plumes its coils were twined within by many a swollen knotted fold and high and far the neck receding lithe and thin sustained a crested head which warily shifted and glanced before the eagle's steadfast eye 
around, around in ceaseless circles, wheeling with clang of wings and scream. The eagle sailed incessantly, sometimes on high, concealing its lessening orbs, sometimes as if it failed, drooped through the air, and still it shrieked and wailed, and casting back its eager head with beak and talon and ripplingly assailed the wreathed serpent who did ever seek upon his enemy's heart a mortal wound to wreak. What life, what power was kindled and arose within the sphere of that appalling fray? For from the encounter of those wondrous foes, a vapour like the sea's suspended spray, hung, gathered in the void air far away, floated the shattered plumes, bright scales did leap, where'er the eagle's talons made their way, like sparks into the darkness as they sweep blood stains the snowy foam of the tumultuous deep. Swift chances in that combat many a check, and many a change, a dark and wild turmoil. Sometimes the snake around his enemy's neck, locked in stiff rings, his adamantine coil, until the eagle, faint with pain and toil, remitted his strong flight, and near the sea languidly fluttered, hopeless so to foil his adversary who then reared on high his red and burning crest radiant with victory then on the white edge of the bursting surge where they had sunk together would the snake relax his suffocating grasp and scourge the wind with his wild writhings for to break that chain of torment the vast bird would shake the strength of his unconquerable wings as in despair and with his sinewy neck dissolve in sudden shock those linked rings then soar as swift as smoke from a volcano springs while baffled wild and strength encountered strength thus long but unprevailing the event of that portentous fight appeared at length until the lamp of day was almost spent it had endured when lifeless stark and rent hung high that mighty serpent and at last fell to the sea while o'er oh, the continent with clang of wings and scream the eagle passed heavily borne away on the exhausted blast and with it fled the tempest, so that ocean and earth and sky shone through the atmosphere. Only it was strange to see the red commotion of waves like mountainous over the sinking sphere of sunset sweep, and their fierce roar to hear amid the calm down the steep path I wound to the seashore. The evening was most clear and beautiful, and there the sea I found calm as cradle child in dreamless slumber bound. There was a woman adorning, there was a woman beautiful as morning, sitting beneath the rocks upon the sand of the waste sea fair, as one flower adorning an icy wilderness, each delicate hand lay crossed upon her bosom, and the band of her dark hair had fallen, so she sate, looking upon the waves on the bare strand upon the sea mark, a small boat did wait, fair as herself, like love by hope left desolate. It seemed that this fair shape had looked upon that unimaginable fight, and now that her sweet eyes were weary of the sun, as brightly it illustrated her woe, for in the tears which silently to flow, pours not its lustre hum, she watching I the foam wreaths which the faint tide wove below, upon the spangled sands groaned heavily, and after every groan looked up over the sea. And when she saw the wounded serpent make his path between the waves, her lips grew pale, parted and quivered the tears ceased to break from her immovable eyes no voice of wail escaped her but she rose and on the gale loosening her star bright robe and shadowy hair poured forth her voice the caverns of the veil that opened to the ocean caught it there and filled with silver sounds the overflowing air she spake in language whose strange melody 
might not belong to earth. I heard alone what made its music more melodious be, the pity and the love of every tone. But to the snake those accents sweet were known, his native tongue and hers, nor did he beat the whore. Spray idly then, but winding on through the green shadows of the waves that meet near to the shore, did pause beside her snowy feet. Then on the sands the woman sate again, and wept and clasped her hands, and all between renewed the unintelligible strain of her melodious voice and eloquent mane. And she unveiled her bosom, and the green and glancing shadows of the sea did play o'er the memorial depth one moment seen. For ere the text, the serpent did obey her voice, and coiled in rest, in her embrace it lay. Then she arose and smiled on me with eyes serene yet sorrowing, like that planet fair, while yet the daylight lingereth in the skies, which cleaves with arrowy beams the dark red air, and said to grieve is wise, but to the despair was weak and vain, which led thee here from sleep. This shalt thou know, and more if thou dost dare, with me and with this serpent o'er the deep. A voyage divine and strange companionship to keep. Her voice was like the wildest, saddest tone, yet sweet of some loved voice heard long ago. I wept, shall this fair woman all alone over the sea with that fierce serpent go? His head is on her heart, and who can know how soon he may defy his feeble prey? Such were my thoughts when the tide began to flow, and that strange boat like the moon's shade did sway amid reflected stars that in the waters lay. A boat of rare device, which had no sail but its own curved prow of thin moonstone, wrought like a web of texture fine and frail, to catch those gentlest winds which are not known to breathe, but by the steady speed alone with which it cleaves the sparkling sea. And now we are embarked, the mountains hang and frown over the starry deep that gleams below, a vast and dim expanse as o'er the waves we go. And as we sailed, a strange and awful tale that woman told, like such mysterious dream as makes the slumberer's cheek with wonder pale. Twas midnight, and around a shoreless stream, wide ocean rolled when the majestic theme shrined in her heart found utterance, and she bent her looks on mine. Those eyes a kindling beam of love divine into my spirit sent, and ere her lips could move, made the air eloquent. Speak not to me, but hear, much shalt thou learn, much must remain unthought, and more untold in the dark future's ever-flowing urn. Know then that from the depth of ages old, two powers o'er mortal things dominion hold, ruling the world with a divided lot, immortal, all-pervading, manifold. Between genii, equal gods, when life and thought sprang forth, they burst the womb of inessential naught. The earliest dweller of the world alone stood on the verge of chaos low, afar o'er the wide, wild abyss, two meteors shone, sprung from the depth of its tempestuous jar, a blood-red comet and the morning star, mingling their beams in combat as he stood, all thoughts within his mind waged mutual war in dreadful apathy, when to the flood that fair star fell, he turned and shed his brother's blood. Thus evil triumphed, and the spirit of evil, one power of many shapes, which none may know, one shape of many names, the fiend did revel in victory, reigning o'er a world of woe, for the new race of man went to and fro, famished and homeless, loathed and loathing, wild and hating, good for his immortal foe. He changed from starry shape, beauteous and mild, to a dire snake, with man and beast unreconciled. 
The darkness lingering o'er the dawn of things was evil's breath and life. This made him strong to soar aloft with overshadowing wings, and the great spirit of good did creep among the nations of mankind, and every tongue cursed and blasphemed him as he passed, for none knew good from evil, though their names were hung in mockery o'er the fane, where many a groan as king and lord and god the conquering fiend did own. The fiend whose name was legion, death, decay, earthquake and blight, and want and madness pale, winged and wan diseases and array, numerous as leaves that strew the autumnal gale, poison a snake in flowers beneath the veil of food and mirth, hiding his mortal head, and without whom all these might naught avail, fear, hatred, faith and tyranny who spread those subtle nets which snare the living and the dead. His spirit is their power, and they his slaves in air and light and thought and language dwell, and keep their state from palaces to graves, in all resorts of men invisible. But when in Eve on mirror night mare fell to tyrant or impostor bids them rise black winged demon forms whom from the hell his reign and dwelling beneath nether skies he loosens to their dark and blasting ministries in the world's youth his empire was as firm as its foundations soon the spirit of good though in the likeness of a lonesome worm sprang from the billows of the formless flood which shrank and fled and with that fiend of blood renewed the doubtful war thrones then first shook and earth's immense and trampled multitude in hope on their own powers began to look and fear the demon pale his sanguine shrine forsook then Greece arose, and to its bards and sages in dream the golden pinion genii came, even where they slept amid the night of ages, steeping their hearts in the divinest flame, which thy breath kindled, power of holiest name, and oft in cycles since, when darkness gave new weapons to thy foe, their sun-like fame upon the combat shone, a light to save, like paradise spread forth beyond the shadowy grave. Such is this conflict when mankind does strive with its oppressors in a strife of blood, or when free thoughts like lightnings are alive, and each bosom of the multitude justice and truth with customs hydra brood, wage silent war when priests and kings dissemble in smiles or frowns their fierce disquietude, when round pure hearts a host of hopes assemble, the snake and eagle meet, the world's foundations tremble. Thou hast beheld that fight, when to thy home thou dost return, steep not its hearth in tears, though thou mayst hear that earth is now become the tyrant's garbage, which to his compeers the vile reward of their dishonoured years, he will divide and give the victor fiend omnipotent of yore, now quails and fears his triumph dearly won, which soon will lend an impulse swift and sure to his approaching end. List, stranger, list, mine is a human form, like that thou wearest, touch me, shrink not now, my hand thou feel'st, is not a ghost, but warm with human blood, t'was many years ago since first my thirsting soul aspired to know the secrets of this wondrous world, when deep my heart was pierced with sympathy for woe which should could not be mine, and thought did keep in dream, unnatural watch beside an infant's sleep. Woe could not be mine own, since far from men I dwelt, a free and happy orphan child, by the seashore in deep mountain glen, and near the waves, and through the forest wild, I roamed to storm and darkness reconciled, for I was calm while tempest shook the sky, but when the breathless heavens in beauty smiled, I wept sweet tears, yet too tumultuously for peace, and clasped my hands aloft in ecstasy. These were forebodings of my fate before a woman's heart beat in my virgin breast. It had been nurtured in divinest lore. A dying poet gave me books and blessed with wild but holy talk. 
the sweet unrest in which I watched him as he died away, a youth with hoary hair, a fleeting guest of our lone mountains, and this law did sway my spirit like a storm, contending there alway. Thus the dark tale which history doth unfold I knew, but not, methinks, as others know, for they weep not, and wisdom had unrolled the clouds which hide the gulf of mortal woe. Too few can she that warning vision show, for I loved all things with intense devotion, so that when hope's deep source in fullest flow, like earthquake did uplift the stagnant ocean of human thoughts, mine shook beneath the wide emotion. When first the living blood through all these veins kindled a thought in sense, great France sprang forth and seized as if to break the ponderous chains which bind in woe the nations of the earth. I saw and started from my cottage hearth and to the clouds and waves in tameless gladness shrieked till they caught immeasurable mirth and laughed in light and music soon swept madness was poured upon my heart a soft and thrilling sadness deep slumber fell on me my dreams were fire soft and delightful thoughts did rest and hover like shadows o'er my brain and strange desire the tempest of passion raging over my tranquil soul its depths with light did cover which passed and calm and darkness sweeter far came then i loved but not a human lover for when i rose from sleep the morning star shone through the woodbine wreaths which round my casement were twas like an eye which seemed to smile on me i watched till by the sun made pale it sank under the billows of the heaving sea but for its beam deep love my spirit drank and to my brain the boundless world now shrank into one thought one image yes forever even like the day spring poured on vapours dank the beams of that one star did shoot and quiver through my benighted mind and were extinguished never the day passed thus at night methought in dream a shade of speechless beauty did appear it stood like light on a careering stream of golden clouds which shook the atmosphere a winged youth his radiant brow did wear the morning star a wild dissolving bliss over my frame he breathed approaching near and bent his eyes of kindling tenderness near mine and on my lips impressed a lingering kiss and said a spirit loves thee mortal maiden how wilt thou prove thy worth then joy and sleep together fled my soul was deeply laden and to the shore i went to muse and weep but as i moved over my heart did creep a joy less soft but more profound and strong than my sweet dream and it forbade to keep the path of the seashore that spirit's tongue seemed whispering in my heart and bore my steps along how to that vast and peopled city led which was a field of holy warfare then i walked among the dying and the dead and shared in fearless deeds with evil men calm as an angel in the dragon's den how i braved death for liberty and truth and spurned at peace and power and fame and when those hopes had lost the glory of their youth how sadly i returned and might move the hearer's truth Warm tears throng fast, the tale may not be said. Know then that when this grief had been subdued, I was not left like others cold and dead. The spirit whom I loved in solitude sustained his child, the tempest-shaken wood, the waves, the fountains, and the hush of night. These were his voice, and well I understood his smile divine, when the calm sea was bright with silent stars, and heaven was breathless with delight. In lonely glens, amid the roar of rivers, when the dim nights were moonless, have I known joys which no tongue can tell? My pale lip quivers, when thought revisits them. Know thou alone, that after many wondrous years were flown, I was awakened by a shriek of woe, and over me a mystic robe was thrown. By viewless hands, and a bright star did glow, before my steps the snake then met his mortal foe. 
Thou fearest not then the serpent on thy heart, fear it, she said, with brief and passionate cry, and spake no more, that silence made me start. I looked, and we were sailing pleasantly swift, as a cloud between the sea and sky, beneath the rising moon seen far away, mountains of ice like sapphire piled on high, hemming the horizon round in silence lay, on the still waters these we did approach or wade. And swift and swifter grew the vessel's motion, so that a dizzy trance fell on my brain. Wild music woke me. We had passed the ocean which girds the pole, nature's remotest reign, and we glowed fast o'er a pelcid plain of water, azure with the noontide day. Ethereal mountains shone around, a fane stood in the midst, girt by green isles which lay on the blue sunny deep resplendent far away it was a temple such as mortal hand has never built nor ecstasy nor dream reared in the cities of enchanted land twas likest heaven ere yet day's purple stream ebbs o'er the western forest while the gleam of the unrisen moon among the clouds is gathering when with many a golden beam the thronging constellations rushing crowds paving with fire the sky and the memorial floods like what may be conceived of this vast dome when from the depths which thought can seldom pierce genius beholds it rise his native home girt by the deserts of the universe yet nor in paintings light or mightier verse or sculpture's marble language can invest that shape to mortal sense such glooms immerse that incommunicable sight and rest upon the labouring brain an overburdened breast winding among the lawny islands fair whose blossomy forests starred the shadowy deep the wingless boat paused where an ivory stair its fretwork in the crystal sea did steep encircling that vast vein's aerial heap we disembarked and through a portal wide we passed whose roof of moonstone carved did keep a glimmering o'er the forms on every side sculptures like life and thought immovable deep-eyed we came to a vast hall whose glorious roof was diamond which had drunk the lightning's sheen in darkness and now poured it through the woof of spell in woven clouds hung there to screen its blinding splendour through such veil was seen that work of subtlest power divine and rare orb above orb with starry shapes between and horned moons and meteors strange and fair on night black columns poised one hollow hemisphere ten thousand columns in that quivering light distinct between whose shafts wound far away the long and labyrinthine isles more bright with their own radiance than the heaven of day and on the jasper walls around there lay paintings the posy of mightiest thought which did the spirit's history display a tale of passionate change divinely taught which in their wing dance unconscious genii wrought Beneath their state on many a sapphire throne, the great who had departed from mankind, a mighty senate, some whose white hair shone like mountain snow, mild, beautiful and blind, some female forms whose gestures beamed with mind, and ardent youths and children bright and fair and some had lyres whose strings were intertwined with pale and clinging flames which ever there waked faint yet thrilling sounds that pierced the crystal air one seat was vacant in the midst a throne reared on a pyramid like sculpted frame distinct with circling steps which rested on their own deep fire soon as the woman came into that hall she shrieked the spirit's name and fell and vanished slowly from the sight darkness arose from her dissolving frame which gathering filled that dome of woven light blotting its feared stars with supernatural night
Then first two glittering lights were seen to glide in circles on the amethystine floor, small serpent eyes trailing from side to side like meteors on a river's grassy shore. They round each other rolled, dilating more and more than rows, commingling into one, one clear a mighty planet hanging o'er, a cloud of deeper shadow which was thrown athwart the glowing steps and the crystalline throne. The cloud which rested on that cone of flame was cloven beneath the planet's sate, a form fairer than tongue can speak or thought may frame, the radiance of whose limbs rose like warm flowed forth and did with softest light in form, the shadowy dome, the sculptures and the state of those assembled shapes, with clinging charm sinking upon their hearts and mine. He sate, majestic yet most mild, calm yet compassionate, wonder and joy a past and faintness threw over my brow, a hand supported me, whose touch was magic strength, an eye of blue looked into mine like moonlight soothingly, and a voice said, Thou must the listener be this day, two mighty spirits now return, like birds of calm from the world's raging sea, they pour fresh light from hope's immortal urn, a tale of human power, despair not, list and learn. I looked and lo, one stood forth eloquently, his eyes were dark and deep, and the clear brow which shadowed them was like the morning sky, the cloudless heaven of spring, when in their flow through the bright air the soft winds as they blow, wake the green world his gestures did obey, the oracular mind that made his features glow, and where his curved lips half open lay, passions die divine a stream, and made impetuous away. Beneath the darkness of his outspread hair, he stood thus beautiful, but there was one who sat beside him like his shadow there, and held his hand far lovelier she was known, to be thus fair by the few lines alone, which through her floating locks and gathered cloak, glances, of soul dissolving glory shone, none else held her eyes in him they woke, memories which found a tongue, and thus he silence broke. <coughs>